Well, with my double vaccination status, my COVID test in the case, and my arrival health form completed, it's off we go. So in today's vlog, I've come along to the former imperial city of Marrakesh in the foothills of the Atlas Mountains in North Africa. Now, it's famous for being a melting pot of food, culture and language. So let's go check it out. So after landing at Manera Airport, it's a short 15 minute drive to the hotel. Hey guys, so I've just checked into my accommodation here in Marrakesh and I'm staying in a hotel called the Medina Gardens, right in the heart of the old city. In fact, just a short walk from the market outside. And this is my home for the next 10 days, a luxury junior swim-up room with pools. So let me give you a quick guided tour. You've got the two sinks and a nice big walk-in shower, the uh, WC behind the door. And of course, as you can probably tell by the bags under my eyes, I'm gonna need some sleep. It was a late flight to so that uh, queen size bed, definitely gonna come in handy a little bit later. And as I mentioned, it is a swim up room. So just beyond the curtains is the pool and we'll check that out tomorrow. Now I did contemplate staying in a Riyadh, but with its lush gardens, this place has one of the best addresses in Marrakesh. Then you'll quickly find yourself in the place they call the Red City and the main landmark could too be a mosque. It's here that one voice rises above any other five times a day with a call to prayer. From there, it's just a short walk to a place which has been a hive of activity since way back in the 11th century. So as the sun sets and the temperature cools, it's time to visit the busiest market in North Africa, Shema El Fana. And here, you can pretty much pick up anything you need. From leather bags to shoes, ceramics to food, there's so much on offer, but this place doesn't really liven up until early evening. Escargot, snails. Now you'll pay in Moroccan dirhams, which is a closed currency and can only be bought in Morocco. But most hotels share the same government controlled exchange rate. Okay, so maybe I was being a bit polite, but if snails aren't your thing, there's a vast array of food on offer, including, um... Do you think the bones out? The bowls? Yeah, the bones. The bones. The bones. <laughs> Not the bowls. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Now that would have been a very different dish. So it's 8.30 here in Marrakesh and despite the hustle and bustle here in Jamar El Fanar, where it's pretty busy, in the sake of 30 minutes, this place will become so quiet. That's because there's a curfew in Marrakesh. Now it was 11 o'clock, it's now 9pm and these guys are packing up pretty quick. Those restrictions are constantly under review, so it's worth checking before you travel. So it's just gone 5 a.m. with the hotel lobby waiting to be picked up for the hot air balloon flight. Now it's a 45 minute drive out to Marrakesh to watch the sunrise over the Atlas Mountains. So if you fancy breathtaking views of Marrakesh from the air, then in my opinion, this has to be on your list of things to do when you visit. After watching the team prepare the balloon for departure, you're soon up in the air on a journey which will cover a distance between 9 and 15 miles. That depends on the wind speed that day. It's here you see the amazing contrast between Morocco's urban and city life. And even though it's a shared flight with other guests, there's still plenty of space. And it's soon time to descend to wherever the wind takes you. So with the crew packing up the balloon, there's just enough time to admire the amazing sunrise. Afterwards, it's back to the Berber tent for a mint tea and a delicious breakfast. Next up, I'm heading to one of the must-see attractions in Marrakesh if you love your Instagram photos. Let's go inside. So next up, I'm checking out Jardin Marjorel or Marjorel Gardens, owned by the famous painter Jacques Marjorel. But that property there later became the home of Yves Saint Laurent, the famous French fashion designer. And it's like a mini oasis in the middle of Marrakesh. This Art Deco electric blue studio is pretty unique. And the gardens include over 300 plant species from five different continents. And if you fancy staying a little longer, there's a neighboring museum devoted entirely to the work of the fashion icon. Instead, I've chosen to see more of the amazing heritage of Marrakesh with a trip to an area which dates back thousands of years. 
So if you've come to Marrakesh in search of world flavors, my top tip, check out the Jewish Quarter. Now this market runs once a week. As you can probably tell behind me, there's next to no tourists and it's where all the locals come to buy their giant bags of spices to sell all across Marrakesh. So it's super cheap. Now, in the labyrinth of alleyways, this place can be hard to find, but I think that's always the best way to stumble across some amazing experiences, including this, a community oven. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's here many bring their delicious food prepared at home to be cooked in a communal oven, and this includes a delicious bread, which is sold nearby. Fresh bread is so good. Or, if you fancy even more culture, there's a nearby palace ruin being watched over by some nesting storks. So El Badi Palace was once the most opulent and splendid palace in all of Morocco, and today, only its ruins remain. That said, the vast courtyard and its four sunken gardens and reflecting pools still give you a hint of this once former majestic appearance. For the best view, head upstairs to see the amazing skyline from the ramparts. After yet another amazing sunset, it's a 7am pickup for our next trip, and one which involved quite a scenic but long drive. So today we're heading high up into the Atlas Mountains to a place called Ouazazet to check out the Hollywood of Morocco. Before that though, there's a stop off at a point which translates roughly to difficult mountain pasture. So at 7,415 feet, you definitely feel the altitude difference at Tijin Atishka, the highest mountain pass in North Africa and the gateway to the Sahara Desert. Then it's on to somewhere which might look a little familiar. So that there is the Kasbah of Ain't Ben Hadou. And as well as Gladiator, it's appeared in Jewel of the Nile, the Bond film, The Living Daylights, more recently the live action remake of Aladdin and Game of Thrones. And it's easy to see why. This UNESCO World Heritage Site and Fortified Village has been the go-to site for filmmakers worldwide ever since Lawrence of Arabia. Today though, only five families are still living inside this giant fortress, which grew as a waypoint for travelers, transporting everything from salt and spices to gold along the major Trans-Saharan route. So it's right there we first see Russell Crowe in the arena in the Gladiator film. And film fans might also want to check out the nearby Atlas Film Studios, which happens to be the biggest in North Africa. It's here you can find film props and sets, including the plane from the Jewel of the Nile, cages from Gladiator, and the chariot from Ben-Hur. With its reliable weather and a huge amount of local extras, it's here you can step back in time to ancient Egypt and the backdrop to films such as The Mummy. or you can swing open the doors to sets from Cleopatra and Alexandra the Great. They've been making films here since way back in the early 80s and the area can mimic a variety of countries around the world. And if Rome is more your thing, the Caesar's house from Brutus. Then there's the room where the slaves waited patiently below the arena in Gladiator for a chance to go on and compete in Rome's famous Colosseum. Or there's the street of Afghanistan, which was the set of Black Hawk Down and the 2006 film Days of Glory. And just around the corner, this backdrop has appeared in everything from Aladdin to the 2010 film Prince of Persia with Jake Gyllenhaal. And when famous director Martin Scorsese couldn't film at an ancient Buddha temple in Tibet, he chose to come here to film Kundan. So Atlas Film Studios is like the Hollywood of Morocco. But it gets even better. So there's a sandstorm about to arrive, so I'm gonna give you a quick tour of this. It was the Jerusalem castle in the film, The Kingdom of Heaven. 
Now, you might recognize it as the place that Ridley Scott brought Orlando Bloom and Liam Neeson, but it's also been the backdrop to so many more hugely popular films and TV shows with just a few small changes inside. This is epic. In fact, this was the backdrop to TV series Vikings, but you might recognize it for a show which has an army of fans world over. Morocco doubled as Astapor and Yunkai, one of the great cities in Slaves Bay of a well-known TV series. So this was the set of Game of Thrones. It's right here in Series 3 of Game of Thrones that Amelia Clarke's character rises to power in the epic dragon scene when she goes on to command an army. This set is a few kilometers away from the main Backlot Studios. And just when the movie buff inside me thought I'd seen enough, I stumbled across this on the way back to the hotel. So this American-style gas station on the outskirts of Wazazet is so authentic, apparently people forever stop here trying to grab fuel, but actually it's part of a film called The Hills Have Eyes in 2006. It's a horror film, and in the film, the people stop here only to take a gruesome and gory shortcut. Only I hope I know one because it's four hours back to Marrakesh. The film is a remake of Wes Craven's 1977 film of the same name, and it made nearly $16 million in the US alone in its opening weekend. In the film, a retired detective and his wife are traveling between Cleveland to San Diego through the desert for a wedding anniversary when they stop off here at this gas station. And what happens next is for those who love a horror movie. It's pretty cool. Now, as luck would have it, I'm allowed inside. This place is normally locked up, but after tipping a local who saw my camera, he decided to give us an entry to explore. She's kind of been left, really. It's mad. It's at the gas station they find news clippings detailing disappearances in the area after a nuclear test by the US government. All fake, of course. So after a long day, which was worth a drive, it's time to head back over the Atlas Mountains to Marrakesh as the sun sets. After some rest, we're off to see another nearby palace, one which means brilliance in Arabic and which is perhaps one of the best preserved historical sites in the area. This sprawling palace is set over two acres in the middle of Marrakesh, Medina, and features 150 rooms and a sun-filled court of honor, but much of the building is now closed off to the public. So this place is Bahia Palace, which was once the royal residence here in Morocco, very opulent, and when uh, Morocco gained independence from France in 1956, the palace was handed over to the Moroccan Ministry of Culture. As well as being a historical museum, the palace has now become famous as a tourist hotspot for Instagrammers due to the rooms and buildings being colourfully decorated in a different, elegant Moroccan style. The palace also houses council rooms with impressive fireplaces, flooring and painted cedarwork, and a large riad surrounded by citrus trees. And finally, well, if you're looking for the pinnacle of luxury, surely this hotel is it. It is a Medina set within a Medina in the old city of Marrakesh. And this place was designed and overseen by King Mohammed himself. Now there's 53 individual riads inside and they'll set you back anything from 1,000 to a staggering 35,000 pounds a night. But that does get you their very own Bentley to and from the airport and an express lane through security. No wonder then this place is a go-to for A-listers, prime ministers, and even royalty. So let's go check it out. This isn't just the most luxurious hotel in Marrakesh. In some guides, it's among the top in the world. When it comes to afternoon tea, you can choose between sitting in the bar or in the open air lobby. And it's the perfect way to end the trip to this centuries old trading hub. Welcome to afternoon tea at the Royal Mansour. 
So sandwich is done. What's next? Oh. Shall we go cake? Which which cake? Should we go cookie? I think it's cookie. I think it's cookie. No. It's pastry. Then there's just time to get used to the new norm of travelling. So just before we go home, we've got to do the rapid antigen test to make sure that we can fly home. So here comes the, the tricky bit. Up each nostril. A moment of truth. After a short wait, the results are in. You then take a photo and send that off to the testing company responsible. Then after filling in your passenger locator form, you should receive your certificate to show you can travel home, both of which they'll want to see at the airport. And that's it. Just enough time then to enjoy the evening sunset at our favorite rooftop overlooking the Medina called El Fen. As always, if you found the video useful, please do like and subscribe using the button below for more travel. And of course, feel free to ask any questions in the comment section below. After flying home to the UK, there's just one more test to do at home, which needs to be sent off by post and you're done.